Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Carrie Mokowski. I am the Director of Education here at FAIR, and I am delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few quick things. Um, just take note that for maintaining a quality recording, everyone joining us today are going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, this is definitely not going to stop you from joining in on the discussion. In your Zoom toolbar, you should see a little Q&A button. You can use this to communicate directly with me. Please let me know if you are having any technical difficulties and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, but most importantly, you can use this feature to ask questions. So we built in some time at the end of the discussion for a few moderated questions. So please feel free to send them my way, you know, kind of at any time. And if time permits at the end, I will pass them along to our presenters. All right, on the next slide, you will see our wonderful panelists who are joining us today. And if I may just take a moment to read you each of their bios because they are extremely impressive. So first we have Sarah Ackerman, AKA girl behind the hive. She has navigated life with food allergies from infancy. She shares her humor, optimism and common sense approach for navigating food allergies in a food centric world by relaying advice and personal anecdotes to her followers. Sarah has worked with Allure Magazine and starred in their pilot episode of How to Be Me, focused on navigating food allergies. Sarah's video received nearly, nearly 400,000 views and she has received thousands of messages from people worldwide detailing how they relate to her life, their wishes to see more food allergy education in the media and thanking her for her willingness to be so candid. A participant in FAIR's inaugural Washington DC fly-in and 2019 Contains Courage Summit, as well as PSAs for EAT and Allergies Together. Sarah has been named one of Spoken's top 100 women in food allergies. She is also a member of FAIR's Rising Leadership Committee and now pursuing her MBA in New York. Next, we have Alexa Jordan. Alexa is a rising junior at Harvard College pursuing a concentration in government, secondary and economics, in a citation in Spanish. Alexa has been recognized as a John Harvard Scholar and she is the recipient of the Presidential Service Award and Mayoral Service Above Self Award. On campus, Alexa serves as representative on the Harvard Undergraduate Council, works as an intern for the Dean of Students Office and serves as a member of the Student Faculty Committee on Student Life. She has had her start in the allergy community when diagnosed with a severe tree nut and peanut allergy. She is also a contributor to Allergic Living and a Spoken Ambassador. She also serves on the FAIR Youth Advisory Council. Last but not least is Lizzie Anderlich. She is a 16-year-old junior at Prospect High School in Mount Prospect, Illinois. Being a FAIR TAG member, she strives to make a positive impact in the allergy community. Her advocacy highlights have included being a finalist in the 2018 Innovation Tank at the FAIR Conference and participating in FAIR's Courage at Congress Day. Lizzie was diagnosed at age five with a severe allergy to tree nuts, peanuts, sesame seeds, and sunflower seeds. Her allergies have been a huge part of her life, especially in school. And at one point she was homeschooled due to her allergies. But through self-advocacy and the help of others, she was able to get back in school and has been very successful. She believes that her allergies have made her a stronger person and is devoted to helping others manage their allergies on an everyday basis. Besides advocating, she enjoys playing the ukulele, tumbling, and baking. Her lifelong goal is to be a pediatric doctor. So I'm so excited to have these presenters here with us today. Their backgrounds are very impressive, but we'd like to take just a quick 15 seconds or so to find out who is joining us. So if you wouldn't mind just filling out this poll that I just launched, um, just so we can find out who's in the audience, you know, whether you're a parent or a caregiver to a child that has food allergy, or maybe you're a teen or young adult with food allergy yourself, or maybe you're here just because you're interested in, in advocacy. So I'll just let this go for a little bit. It looks like kind of about like 30% in each of them. So we have a really good mix with us um, here today. So that's awesome. So I'll go ahead and end this poll and it is my pleasure to pass it off to Sarah to get us started. Hi everybody, we are super excited to be here and sharing with you today. So just to kick it off, uh, we thought it would be nice for all of you to know that um, Alexa, Lizzie and I actually all met at the inaugural Courage at Congress event that FAIR held in March um, in Washington, DC. 
So for those who don't know what we did there, we met with our representatives and we spoke to them about the upcoming food allergy legislation. So every representative in office that I met with had a food allergy story and somebody with allergies that they cared about. And for me, I just saw, thought that that goes to show how many people allergies affect and how important using our voices really is. All right, so you got the intro about me, but just uh, a little bit more. I'm 25 years old. I'm currently pursuing my MBA and I run the Instagram and blog account, um, Girl Behind the Hive. And so what I like to do there is share my personal food allergy experiences, some of my thoughts and also food allergy friendly product recommendations. Hi everyone. So grateful to be with you all today. Uh, Sarah is the grandma in the family and she is, we all look up to her and so we're really excited to be presenting with Sarah today. Uh, my name is Alexa Jordan. Thank you so much Carrie for such a wonderful uh, introduction, a little bit formal. Uh, a little bit more fun is I absolutely love politics. I love everything fitness, travel, advocacy, and you'll hear about my story in just a few moments, but I actually wasn't as committed to the food allergy advocacy, advocacy committee um, and fair efforts before two summers ago. So I'll tell you about that in a little bit, but a little bit about me. I have three younger siblings. I'm the only one in my family who has food allergies, but I have a severe food allergy to tree nuts uh, and used to be peanuts. So really excited to be with you guys today. Hi everyone. My name is Lizzie Anderlich. I'm a high school junior from the Chicagoland area. Like Carrie said, I'm allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, and sunflower seeds. Um, I've been with FAIR for a few years now, and since then I've really developed a passion for teen advocacy, empowerment, and leadership. I'm so honored to be speaking with Alexa and Sarah. And now Alexa is going to share our goals. Yes, yeah, so today I'm really excited to share kind of the rundown of what we're gonna try to accomplish in the next hour. So first we're going to talk about key skills and refining those skills. And what exactly does that mean, right? So we, we're gonna learn how to craft a narrative, articulate your purpose and choose a target audience. Second, we're going to locate additional online tools and resources that you can leverage uh, to amplify your voice now and in the future. Uh, third, we're going to be hearing from our peers about how they have made an impact. And finally, we're gonna talk about how to make achievable and really impactful goals, and how to reach those goals. So first, I just wanna kick it off by talking about a narrative. And this is something that's really important to me as I've had to use this time and time again throughout my advocacy efforts. So first, what? What is a narrative? And quite simply, it's your food allergy story. You have to ask yourself, what makes you tick? What is it that you wanna share with others? It's something that's compelling. It's real, authentic, and consistent. And it's something that you'll bring to the when or the platforms for using this narrative. So it's the media that you engage yourself with. It's, it's the written component. It's the interviews that you, that you do for the experiences that you have and for the efforts that you're launching. It's the interpersonal interactions with those around you. It's with your congressman, it's with your friends, it's with other food allergy advocates and it's also in formal settings. So there's a lot of different platforms in which you'll be using this story, but again, it's really important to keep that story and your experiences consistent, uh, concise, and just bring that, that image to the table. So, and then finally is the question of why does it need to be consistent? Why does it need to be authentic? And why does it need to be true to you? Well, people love to hear from other real people. They love to hear about uh, things, well, they love to hear when other people go through the same thing that they're going through. And as a food allergy advocate, you will know that lots of people, 32 million individuals in this nation have food allergies and you're going to be able to directly impact each of their lives, um, but you have to be vulnerable in order to do so and share your story. So let's go to the next slide. And the next principle is well, articulating this purpose. And this is a little bit different than your story or your narrative because from your story and from your narrative, can you draw your purpose? So first I would tell you to think, if you had all the resources in the world, what would you like to accomplish? 
especially in the food allergy community. And again, this is a, a, a way to think about advocacy for any issue. So this will apply to food allergies, but also apply to basically anything you want to advocate for in your local community, your national community, et cetera. And again, I just have to tell you, dream big. What kind of impact do you want to make? This is your call to action. And if you're unsure, I mean, this is very common as well, but you know that you want to have some sort of impact. One helpful thought exercise is to ask yourself what things, when you look around in the world, what make you upset? And what do you wish other people knew or understood about you, your condition with food allergies, your identity with food allergies, et cetera? And why do you think this would be important? Well, it's actually the audience. It's the people who are gonna help your goal come to life. So first is who's gonna hear your message? Who do you wanna impact? Where does the change need to occur? This is all part and parcel with the purpose idea. Additionally, you have to think about who needs to hear your goals for you to be successful, right? This is the, the key um, administrators, et cetera, that you need to contact in order to get your message across. And if you want just a few examples, it could be your friends and family. It could be your school classroom and the principal is the other audience that you really need to uh, hone in on. With that in mind, let's do a little bit of a thought exercise. So let's have our first scenario. So scenario one, you just had a serious allergic reaction on an airplane coming home from your first year at Harvard. You asked the flight attendants for Benadryl and epinephrine. They had neither. Your phone stopped working. You couldn't talk to your parents. You had no one on the flight with you. You haven't been very active in the food allergy community before. You've never heard of FAIR or other allergy uh, blogs, you have no connections, and this terrible thing just happened to you, what do you do? Well, you have one option is to tell no one, get over it, go to therapy, or you can let that inside action, right? So step one would be to craft a narrative. What happened, right? So just really quickly, I know you guys can read. I can read too, so let me read it, <laughs> and we can read it together. So on May 15th, I bought a salad that did not contain nuts to eat on my flight back to Chicago. In fact, none of the salads on the menu were supposed to contain nuts. As someone who has lived with severe tree nut allergy their whole life, I'm always extremely careful about what I buy. Within five minutes of takeoff, I ate one piece of chicken. To my horror, my throat started tingling, scratching, and then tightening. I was going into anaphylaxis 30,000 feet in the air from a piece of cashew cross contamination. I ran to the front of the cabin and asked the Southwest flight attendants if they had any Benadryl. And I quickly explained that I have a severe Trina allergy and that my throat was beginning to shut. They told me they did not have any and they looked flustered and alarmed. So I got my story straight. I figured out exactly what happened and articulated that in a concise manner that I first, I bolstered my ethos. Why am I talking to them? Well, I have a food allergy and I've had one my whole life. That gives me some experience. I mean, a lot of people, they've worked in a career their whole life. Well, guess what? You are an expert in having food allergy and you have had good experiences, poor experiences. And you can use that to build your credibility when you walk into any room and say, I've had this experience for 10 years. I've had this experience for 25 years. And automatically you are given respect that other people who haven't had a food allergy can't automatically um, have. So, I mean, just think of it this way. You already have a wonderful leverage tool when you go to talk to administrators or talk to other audience members like friends or family. Step two is to pick a purpose. What do you want to do with your story? So the, in this hypothetical situation, the federal aviation needs to require training on what to do for all flight attendants when a passenger is suffering an allergic reaction and require that there be an EpiPen on board 32, not 40, million Americans have severe food allergies and many more do not th know that they have one. So you've articulated your purpose, your call to action, what needs to happen. And then finally is who is your audience? Who do you need to talk to? And in this case, since you're targeting the FAA and the Senate, you're going to talk about legislators, lobbyists, news outlets, friends, family, friends of friends. And basically any possible connection that you think you might have. Again, this would, again, in this hypo, hypothetical situation, not every story is gonna be so dramatic and that's totally fine. You could still use your small experiences that you have and use those to craft that purpose and to craft that narrative and then find the appropriate audience for those experiences. 
So psych, that was me. Um, and that was two years ago. And this is completely true, right? I started the petition. Uh, I have almost 200,000 signatures on my petition. I know that I'm sure there's some of you in this room who have heard about this story. Um, I know we went through a lot of different allergy uh, circles, but what was so striking is I received, uh, similar to Sarah with her alert video, which you'll hear about in just a moment, um, I received outpouring from all sorts of people, not people who had friends with food allergies, people who had didn't even know food allergies existed. So the thing is, is putting out your voice doesn't just help uh, the people who have food allergies. It helps educate and alert the community to things that need to change. And look, I'm a normal girl. I go to Harvard. I'm a junior at Harvard now. Um, and I do things with student government and I've worked really hard, but I'm no celebrity, but I still got to be featured in all of these really cool outlets like Boston Globe, CNN. Um, and guess what? It worked. You know, I got to go to DC. I got to meet with lobbyists. I still have connections with the lobbyists that I worked with. I still have connections with my Senator. And so just having that moment to reach out is so, so important. And what I'm really excited you guys will be able to do um, with further advocacy efforts that, that you want to pursue. So with that, let me turn it over to Lizzie for talking about local advocacy. Thank you so much, Alexa. I'm so excited to be here today. You can go to the next slide. So when seeking local advocacy opportunities, it's important to keep your community stakeholders in mind. This can include residents, community groups, government workers, business owners, and much more. These are the people close to you who can support you in your efforts, so you're going to want to have them near. And you want to drive your advocacy off your own personal experiences. So no matter if you're a caregiver of someone with food allergies or have food allergies yourself, we all have stories that can create change. So think about your hardships and from there you can build a personalized idea that can lead to action. Now on the next slide, you'll see one of the advocacy opportunities I've had. So for example, growing up with food allergies, I had a hard time in school. I had to navigate awkward situations at a young age, deal with rude comments from classmates and even sometimes teachers, and had staff refuse to accommodate me several times, which left me feeling isolated and alone. But however, it was these challenges that drove me to create change. So when I decided that I wanted to advocate, I reached out to my old elementary school teacher, I mean principal, sorry, and he and I said, and I presented to him an idea that I had to present to schools. I found that I used the FAIRS Be a Pal program, which stands for Protect a Life. It's a great program. It educates middle school and elementary school students and teaches them how they can be a pal, which is what protect, how they can be a pal to those with food allergies. I also read them the story of Nutley the Nut Free Squirrel which is about a squirrel who is ironically allergic to nuts. And I found that children were so understanding and wanted to keep learning more. You can go to the next slide. So the response. Like I said, I presented to schools and I found that the response was so heartwarming. I found that students were engaged the whole time and wanted to learn more. In fact, there were so many questions, I couldn't even answer them all. I even received a few thank you cards, which you can see on the screen. One of my favorites said, you made me feel accommodated, which was more than I could ever ask for. And it proved that my story had the power to change the direction of someone else's. So never underestimate the ability of your story to create change. And on the next slide, you'll see another advocacy opportunity that I've been a part of. So I'm a part of FAIR, like I mentioned, and I've been able to advocate through their teen advisory group. It's a group of teens ages 11 to 22 who are passionate about creating change within the food allergy community. We build and work on projects together. And this year I've been a part of Securing Safe Food. It's an awareness initiative led by Rachel Brooks. She's a food allergic teen from Connecticut. And our goal is to increase food allergy accessibility outside the home. Our current initiative is to establish a segregated allergy-friendly supply of food within food pantries. 
So as you can imagine, it's really necessary and needed. So far, we've been able to partner with 55 brands, serve 25 food pantries, and donate over 42,000 ounces of allergy-friendly and gluten-free items. I am so proud of our team. It's the experience has taught me a lot about being prepared and organized since we have had to label every, everything we donate with allergy information to ensure safety. And we have partnered with brands, so it's taught me a lot about reaching out and people have been so willing to support us just by getting the word out. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to Securing Safe Food on Instagram. You can go to the next slide. I've also developed a passion for advocating for legislation. I got involved with the FASTER Act through Fair's Teen Advocacy Group. The act updates allergen labeling laws to include sesame and requires the federal government to analyze the most promising research opportunities to help scientists develop more effective treatment for food allergies. So as you can imagine, it's really necessary and needed. And since I have a sesame allergy, it really hits ho close to home too. I was mentored by John Hoffman from FAIR along with a few other teens. He taught us how to set up a meeting with our Congress member and empowered and encouraged, encouraged us the whole way. He gave us information and FAIR truly made the process so easy. In late August of last year, I met with my representative Jan Schakowsky and she co-sponsored the act. And on the next slide, you will see some tips for local legislation. So I would advise anyone who's interested in learning more about the FASTER Act and wanting to advocate to go to FAIR's website. It's the first link in the resources column. It's really great. It, get, it provides um, detailed information on the act and shows you how you can advocate and sign up for an advocacy email. So I would definitely check it out. You also are going to want to be persistent when setting up a meeting. Congress members are really busy. So be persistent. You might have to make those a few calls, um, a few emails. I know I did, but the meeting will happen. Number two is to briefly prepare beforehand. You're gonna to wanna to know what you wanna say and be open and share your story. Everyone has stories that they can share that are impactful. And by the time you go into the meeting with your Congress member or staffer, depending on who you're meeting with, you will already, they will already know about the act. I know my Congress member already had it printed out. So I just had to share my story and be open. And she really connected with that and stuck with her. And you're going to want to know your ask and stand topic. Your ask, of course, is for co-sponsorship if they already haven't. And number five is to take pictures and share on social media. Um, my Congress member took a picture with me. Uh, representatives and senators love to take pictures with kids. So make sure that you ask for one. They might even post it on social media. And then the last two resources I have are a link um, to find your House of Representative. And number three, the other link is to be able to find who your Senator is. And here are my top five tips for getting started for advocating locally in general. The first one is to cold call or cold email offices, school board members, or just post in local chats. You just wanna get yourself out there. It's all about being open so other people can help you and aid you in your efforts. So don't be afraid. Number two is to rely on those you already know. Family and friends are a great place to start. Like I said, I reached out to my food banks and I reached out to my old school principal to set up a meeting with him. And it's great to just rely on those community stakeholders who can already help you. Number three is to be open to feedback and guidance. There were plenty of times where I had to rethink my process and people had to kind of guide me along the way. Of course, I'm still a teen, so there's definitely things that I could use help on. And it was really great. And number four is to team up with other advocates. So as you can see, I've teamed up with Sarah and Alexa, and they have been such great role models for me, um, like big sisters. And it's been so amazing to have that support system to lean on while doing advocacy. Number five is to share your efforts on social media. People will listen through social media, especially some of my friends have said, oh my gosh, I want to advocate for this. How do I do that? It's great because they wouldn't have been involved otherwise. And lastly, you're going to want on the next slide, 
you're going to want to build your confidence. Advocating can be hard and nerve wracking, which is why you're gonna to wanna to build up your confidence. And I like to do that by knowing my worth. Anyone is worthy of being an advocate and anyone can do it. You just have to put yourself out there and be open. Number two is to know that you are not alone. There are so many people who will not only be grateful for your efforts, but will want to support you. And there's just so many people in the food allergy community. You can feel free to reach out to Alexa, um, Sarah, or myself, and we would be happy to help you. The other one is to understand that change starts with you. You can't wait for the change that you're seeking for, especially if you're building it off of your own personal experience. Like Alexa said, she created change based off of her own hardship on an airplane, which is crazy and insane. And she, I'm so proud of her. Number four is to come as you are. You do not need to be perfect. I remember when I just started advocating, I was really worried about what other people would think, but come as you are. And number five is to know that with experience is gonna come that empowerment and confidence you need. The more you advocate, the more you're gonna feel comfortable and you're gonna build that confidence and you're gonna to wanna to keep on doing it. Advocacy has opened so many doors for me and has shown me that I can use my voice even as a teen. And next we are gonna hear from blog and social media influencer, Sarah. Hello again, everybody. So um, I just wanted to quickly say my list of allergies because I did not in the introduction. So I have anaphylactic food allergies to peanuts, tree nuts, soy, sesame, legumes, fish, shellfish, and mustard. Next slide, please. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. Everybody pay very close attention. <laughs> my name is Sarah. I'm 24 years old, and I live with multiple life-threatening food allergies. This is how it impacts every aspect of my life. This is how to be me. So there are a number of products that I always need to be carrying with me to make sure that I'll be safe and if I have an allergic reaction that I have them right away to use. Most important ones are my Obicues. I always carry two. Everyone who has food allergies should always carry two because the first one could not work or it could not be enough if your reaction is really severe. I think that's great. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I was very fortunate that I got this opportunity to do a video with Alora and Condé Nast um, and talk just about my food allergies. So I spoke about everything that I've been experiencing for the past 24 years and got to do it in a long eight hour session. So I had no idea what they were going to use in the final 15 minute video, um, but that brief clip that you saw where I spoke about um, my auto injectors and I personally use Avihues shows the importance of advocating and sharing your story. Because while I did spend some of the videos speaking about, you know, makeup and dating and all different experiences, one of the things that they thought was so important was to make sure that people um, knew that they should be carrying auto injectors if they had severe food allergies. Um, so before I did this video, I created my own brand on multiple social media platforms before any of that happened. So um, as previously mentioned, my brand is Girl Behind the Hive, and there are a few main social media platforms that people use, um, including myself, in order to share their messages. So the main ones that I focus on um, are listed here, except TikTok. I do not have a TikTok yet. Um, but on Instagram, for example, one of the big things with Instagram is that you can have chain Instagram stories or post challenges and different hashtag movements. So what that means is that you're engaging all different audiences. You might be reaching some accounts that you wouldn't necessarily reach by yourself. And it's all focused on community, which is extremely important, um, especially in the food allergy community, as you all know. With TikTok and YouTube, they use algorithms. So that um, really depends on the views. It kind of takes what you like to watch and then gives you videos that are similar. TikTok has a for you page and so does YouTube. And so I have had a number of uh, friends, acquaintances, peers, people who don't have food allergies, reach out to me and say that they had my video from Allure pop up on their YouTube channel. Um, and then they clicked on it and watched it. So as a result of them watching that one um, Allure video that related to food allergies, suddenly they started getting my um, allergy YouTube channel popping up in their For You page as well. So all it takes is one click to get you there on that page um, at first. And, and that's the biggest thing. It's all that one click. With Twitter, 
I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with Twitter and retweets and replies. And that's just kind of how things get circulated. The thing with Twitter is that your message has to be very short um, and concise in order to reach an audience. But sometimes that works better than having a longer message. And finally, Facebook, you have the share and like fun functions and you can reach the whole world through your Facebook posts. Um, as long as you have them public, I have a separate Girl Behind the Hive Facebook page um, that I have all the posts public so that they can freely circulate and share, uh, be shared. And through that, I have been able to really um, build an audience. Next slide, please. So sharing your story. You want to build a following across all the different social media platforms that you're using, and you want it to be consistent so that your messaging um, stays the same. So you can start your own website through a number of different platforms, and a ton of them have free resources. So maybe if you're thinking about taking the dive in but aren't entirely sure, you can try some of these free resources to build your own website. Personally, I used Wix to build my website and found it to be extremely user-friendly. Um, I never had done anything like this before and was able to do it all myself. So again, take advantage of those free tools. You also wanna share your real and honest experiences, both the negatives and the positives. The reason that I started sharing my story was because I was seeing a lot of negatives um, and I wasn't really seeing any positive stories. But I wanted to give other food allergic people the positives too and share some of the good things that come along with having food allergies. Finally, you advocate for yourself every day. So find a medium that you're comfortable with, whether it's videos, poetry, blog posts, art, anything that you want, and you know, start sharing. Go for it. <laughs> Next slide. Sharing your experiences. So these have been some of my most popular posts on social media. And this just goes to show that people want to hear the everyday things and find um, ways to relate to them. So think about the things that you would want to see. Uh, the very tiny print list was a post that I did where I shared all different um, coupon codes for all sorts of allergy, uh, food allergy friendly brands at the beginning of the pandemic. And that was to support the local big businesses. The next one was when the FDA um, changed their labeling requirements due to the pandemic. And I wrote a letter um, to the FDA that was widely circulated. Following that, you can see what food allergies look like with that pile of medication. I'm sure you've all been there and you're very grateful when you get to throw out um, an expired auto injector um, compared to the alternative. And finally, um, my college dorm room is the last one. And just sharing these experiences, things that people go through and saying, you know, of course, there's always the chance something bad could happen, but overall, it's completely normal, completely positive, and I've had great experiences to share. Um, next slide, please. So um, I have my Instagram set as a business profile, so I can see my audience demographics and engagement. And if any of you have Instagrams that you're using for that purpose, I definitely recommend um, switching it over to a business account so you can see who is engaging with your content. So don't be discouraged if you lose some followers because it'll show you if you gain or lose followers, it happens all the time. And as long as you're being true to your voice, you should stay content, uh, confident in the content that you're creating. Don't let anybody unfollowing you get you down. Um, just be true to yourself. So uh, for reaching your audience, you want to find accounts um, that you admire and engage with them and their audiences because so much of building your audience is about collaboration and engagement. You want to find what makes your voice unique and exciting. You might not even realize uh, who you are touching. I've heard from strangers and formed a lot of amazing food allergy connections, but I've also heard from some of my friends who are either dating people with food allergies or have family members um, who have food allergies. And by kind of making my Instagram a bit of an you know, open book diary, um, my friends and family members have then been able to connect more um, with people who have food allergies because they never realize the full effects of food allergies on everything and everybody. Um, next slide, please. So I got to have that national platform with Allura to share everything um, that I wanted to about food allergies. Obviously, I had no clue what was going to end up in the final video, but I did make sure to try to share and emphasize uh, the important messages. And so I have been so lucky to have a lot of collaborations since then. And um, a quick story that's fun is uh, the people at Condé Nast and Allure 
who produced this. They were an amazing team and they worked so hard to make sure that I was comfortable and safe throughout the entire day. But it was kind of funny because I'm so used to having people um, around me at this point who understand food allergies, at least a little bit. But when I walked into this room that day, they were terrified. They gave me a pen to sign something and then immediately said that they didn't know who used it before and could I use it? Do they want me to Lysol it or, you know, clean it, get me a new pen? And of course, it was so nice of them to, um, you know, be worried like that. But I took that moment to explain, OK, I am a totally normal person um, and, you know, I I walk around in society every day and Obviously, everybody's comfort level is a little bit different, but for me, making a little bit of a joke about that, um, where they still understood the severity of my food allergies, but also were able to acknowledge that I can function in the real world was definitely very important to me. Um, and the whole vibe of the room changed after that. They immediately relaxed a little bit and everything kind of was smooth sailing from then on. Next slide, please. So, so much of your personal brand is about staying consistent in your message. Whatever you decide you want to share, stick with that same voice. So if you decide that you want to partner with a company, um, partnership should not influence what you say to your followers. In fact, it should be the opposite. Your message and personality should be what attracts a brand um, to partner with you. So you want to be authentic and you want to partner with companies that you trust and that you fully believe in. And feel free to reach out to companies you're passionate about. They're always looking for real people to, you know, try their products and share the, um, their messages and their products on your social media page. So you should definitely reach out to um, companies and share what makes you unique and why you are um, a consumer who they should, you know, let share their product with the world. What you don't want to do is you don't want to do anything that would make you uncomfortable. You don't want to endorse a product that you wouldn't feel safe eating or using. Um, I never would post anything that I um, feel unsafe about or unsure about. And you don't want to be pushed into sharing a product that you don't feel comfor comfortable with. I personally would never post a product um, that I don't feel comfortable eating. And in fact, I have received products um, and told brands that I can't post it because I'm not comfortable with their manufacturing practices um, that they have listed on the label. So the main takeaway here with partnering with brands is to stay true to yourself. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the brands um, that I have been so lucky to partner with. And I'm a big believer in every single one. And I think that's the important thing is that you use your voice to show what you believe in. So if you believe that a brand is worth sharing, then you should be that passionate in your message when you reach out to them, um, see if they're interested in collaborating with you. And again, always just listen to your gut, trust your gut. If something seems a little bit off about the product, it's okay to say no. And so finally, we're gonna talk really quickly about next steps. So thank you so much to Sarah and Lizzie for your comments. Um, I think it's all very powerful and I wholeheartedly agree with every single thing that they said. Right there at the end, Sarah was talking about being authentic. And I think that's a theme that you will see a little thread running through all three of our presentations. Um, that is truly the way to get an engagement I and mean, how to be an advocate is to share yourself, and share your authentic self with the world. Uh, so in the next steps, how do we make goals? Well, there's three different types of goals. There's immediate goals. There's goals, maybe it'll take you a month, two months, three months, more medium term, term time goals. And then there's long-term goals where you wanna start your own company. You want to launch a new product, um, et cetera. You wanna get a bill passed. And those are more long-term goals. They're gonna take a lot of intermediary steps. And so when you're setting goals, we have to think about very smart goals, right? So first, what specific platform do you want to start spreading your goals on? Uh, why is this goal attainable? How will you measure the impact that you're making in person online? And although we don't have as much time as we'd like to talk about this final piece, which is the goal setting, uh, I think one thing that would be really nice to do right now, uh, if anyone has a piece of paper or post it uh, with you, go ahead and jot down a few ideas that have come to you uh, to, through, throughout today's presentation. So perhaps that might be how we'll use your Instagram to promote uh, products that you're passionate about. Are you posting something right now that you're not 
being very authentic and your followers can totally see that. Um, have you started a blog yet? Have you started a website? As we are coming to our question and answer portion, um, again, if you have any questions for us, we're really excited uh, to hear from you. But again, it's all about, it, it starts with a goal. It starts with a purpose statement. It starts with your experiences and your story. Like Lizzie and Sarah said, you have credibility. You have something very valuable to tangibly help and touch the lives of others. And so it really is up to you in this moment, whether or not you will use your voice to positively influence the lives of others. It is not about you. It's about others. And truly, you will be able to help other people through your advocacy, whether that be in local government, in the classrooms, you could be saving a life. So I really hope you join us and we'll continue your wonderful advocacy efforts. One thing that I have loved is coming into a space, uh, whether it be at the fair, um, uh, fly in for the, the day at Congress, or whether that's uh, starting to follow more allergy blogs and really getting to understand what the food allergy community is all about. So I'm a newcomer and I just want to say that I'm really excited to be here because you all are powerful and have the tools to make incredible change. So we want you to talk to us. Let's, let's hang out. Let's talk. Let's chat. So we have put all of our emails, our Instagrams, um, our Facebooks, uh, and our website. I just created mine last night. So would love the <laughs> engagement. But I know that I'm speaking for all three of us here when I say, please contact us. We want to hear you, hear about what you're doing, what projects you are passionate about. If you want help, we will try to help you. So we're here for you. Sarah, Lizzie, do you have anything to add? You summed it all up. Um, please, please reach out to us. We love to hear from people and connect with you um, and just, you know, share your experiences. Awesome. Yeah, All right, we would so love to go ahead, Carrie. We, I was just gonna say we would love to have you know any questions, feel free to contact us. Yes. And I think Carrie, we're gonna do questions. Now. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, that message is just so powerful. And I think Lizzie, you were saying um, never underestimate the ability of your story to create create change, and that's so true. And um, so I'm so appreciative of, of y'all being here, and I will jump right to the questions because we got a few. Um, this is from someone who's actually watching on Facebook Live because we're streaming on there too. And she asks, does anyone have any advice on how to encourage, you know, some of the younger ch children to get involved in advocacy? Kind of more of that younger age? Sure. So I can share from personal experience. Um, I am very outspoken about my experiences now, but when I was growing up, I was very shy <laughs> about them. And so, you know, it was just kind of starting to do things um, with my parents where maybe they would have me read the label, you know, with them um, in a grocery store or start to speak up when I went to a restaurant and just starting with the little actions like that, um, teal pumpkin, now is a great time for you to sort of um, do that with your child and create a teal pumpkin and talk about, you know, what that means to them and how they feel about their food allergies. Um, but it's just starting out small and kind of going from there. One thing, I think Lizzie could really talk about this because you really have already started to reach out to those elementary school students um, is I would shy away for now. I think once you're over the age of 13, that is when you're allowed to really become a very vocal advocate on YouTube channels. Um, but right now there's a few legal things where it's a little bit hard to do that virtual ad advocacy. But as far as local communities go, um, it is all about, so if, if they're interested, I don't know, if this is coming from a child or for maybe a younger kid themselves, but for all y'all elementary schools and middle school students out there, you are more powerful than you know. A local community, local legislators are a great place to start. Um, one thing that my school district has not done is have presenters come in and come talk about their food allergies. Have people come in your food allergies in, in your classrooms and talked about food allergies and why we need to be respectful of snack time. Um, so maybe if they're shy, um, that could also uh, lead to a different approach. So there's a lot of different ways, but 
at least my personal recommendation would be wait a little bit longer for the virtual Instagram, YouTube uh, type things, but then uh, that, that local really great engagement, I think would be really awesome, but feel free to disagree with me, you other two. But. Yeah, I totally agree with Alexa. I think it's all about just getting that start. So I went into elementary schools, I shared my experience and I explained the severity. And I think it was, I think that really sparked interest in kids. I think it's all just about starting, especially like Sarah said, being a kid with food allergies, I was really fearful at first of, of speaking up and I didn't want people to, you know, make rude comments and stuff. But I just, once I started, it made me feel so much more confident. Like I said, empowerment comes from the experience. So the more you're going to, you know, get yourself out there, the more you are going to just want to keep advocating. And truly, there's so much you can do within your community. You can do the Teal Pumpkin Project. You can, you know, talk to schools. If you're older, you can start a club. There's just limitless options. It's all just about, you know, starting and taking that first step. Wonderful. Thank you guys. That's such great advice. And kind of speaking about um, empowerment, we had someone ask, I think it was a parent, um, and he was asking, what are some of the things that maybe your parents did to you or some, sorry, did to help you feel empowered? You know, can you recall any type of experience where maybe your parents stood up for you and that made you feel really proud and they were fighting for you in this journey and it kind of empowered you to, to do the same? Sure. Um, well, there's so much, honestly, that I have learned about now that just blows me away. Um, so I'm 25 years old. So I went to kindergarten a very, very long time ago. And um, my parents had to really fight the school to, and I went to public school for them to um, let me go with food allergies. And, you know, the superintendent did not want me to attend the school um, and said that I should be homeschooled. And my first day, there were multiple news stations waiting outside NBC um, you know, for the five-year-old female who had a peanut allergy. And so just seeing how much things have changed since then, my parents fought those fights. I didn't know about it. All through elementary school, they were doing things um, and having to advocate on my behalf. And I had a very normal childhood and things come up now where I'm like, really, that happened? And it's, it's crazy, but, you know, I'm very grateful that I wasn't aware of all the terrible um, things that happened at that time and now just see a lot of the positives that have come from me having food allergies. I just have to give a big shout out for any parents listening that had children with food allergies. Um, I'm the only child in my family of four who has food allergies and I know how hard my parents work. Every single um, thing that they buy at the store, if it has nuts or may contain nuts, they buy a similar product for me. We have protocols in the house. Um, and so as far as to more directly answer your question about advocacy and how parents can help, you know, really influence their kids to take their hard experiences and, and turn them into positive ones. Um, I don't know if there was a specific moment in which my parents helped teach me to do this, but I think that Honestly, it comes, food allergies was a really hard moment throughout my whole life. I was afraid. I had a lot of anxiety growing up thinking about, I called them food germs, like dust particles and nuts. My parents had to tell me they didn't, that didn't exist. There's no such thing as like contamination of services, but luckily I never really had too many issues with that uh, as a younger child. Again, that's why I said I was not super active, but then got more active when I had the airplane incident, but all types of adversity, I would say in your life can help you be a better food allergy advocate. So when I was a junior in high school, I suffered a very serious concussion um, at, while I was playing soccer. I was a very active athlete. Again, this is, it's also had actually some ties to food allergies uh, with my soccer team, but we don't need to go into that. Um, but when I got that concussion, it stopped my, I was a sophomore in high school. So let me see, like, I'm trying to count seven years of being in soccer. It ended my career. And that was a really hard experience. But the way you learn resilience is 
through going is is going through very hard times being able but being able to see how you can make it into something positive and I truly believe that if I had not gotten a concussion when I was a sophomore in high school I would not have I will not be at Harvard today um, I completely changed uh, my per perspective towards school and academics um, I started starting my own clubs you know so it's just that pattern of thinking that you can take hard things in your life and to put them into action. And it was without the encouragement of, of my mom specifically, there's no way that I would have been able to do things that I've done now with this petition. It's really teaching your kids to stand up for themselves um, in every situation and to be resilient. Yeah, I really love what Alexa said. I think that your empowerment is gonna come from your challenges. And it's in the moments where you feel like you can't go on that you're gonna get stronger and you're gonna be able to help others. My parents have always told me that like everything happens for a reason. And I remember when I was in school and I was having some issues with the staff not accommodating me, it was my dad who stood up for me and really just guided me and said like, whatever happens, you know, I had a lot of fear about my future and how I would handle food allergies. And he said, whatever happens, you're going to find a way you're, you know, where there's a will, there is a way. And so it was just about them leading by example and showing me that everything is possible if I put my mind to it. And those challenges really um, inspired me to keep going. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we have a question came in from Heather. Heather, thanks for joining us. Um, she asked, what advice would you give to people who have reached out, let's say to lawmakers, but they haven't gotten a reply, or maybe they got a reply and it wasn't necessarily good news. Can you just give any advice on some of those certain setbacks and how to kind of keep moving forward if that does happen in your advocacy? Try again. Yeah. I would definitely say that Lizzie talked about this in her presentation. So Lizzie, I'm gonna pass this off to you in just a second. But legislators are busy. But the thing is, is you need to get their intent. Okay, so let me back up, back up. That is what happened to me two summers ago. I called my my senator. They didn't really care. I mean, they, they showed some interest, like, thank you for contacting us, but this is not something we want to pursue at this time. Then I started a petition. I got support and they're like, oh, wait, 200,000 people care about this. Okay, maybe I should reconsider. And many of these people are Illinois citizens. So they're going to be the ones reelecting me. Think about the incentive structure here. If they, sure, it's like nice to help someone with food allergies, but if they know that those people that you're helping are in your state, they're people who will come out to vote for them again. It's all about, you know, pulling the right levers and knowing that they want to make their constituents happy happy and persistence will show them that you're not giving up and you'll be unhappy with their performance if you do not if they do not help you with your effort so it, it's really about uh getting support not just yourself but getting lots of different people throughout your out maybe it's the allergy community in your city maybe it's you and another friend who has a food allergy you go and you both send emails if you guys have been seeing any of the advocacy over the summer with Black Lives Matter, what have people been doing? They create a uh, petition or some sort of like uh, autofill, like write your name here and sign your name here um, and send it to all the legislators, like click here now for the template and you can just fill in your name. Give those to your friends who don't have food allergies. Make it known that this is an issue your legislator needs to pay attention to and they will. So I, I would definitely say that it's all about incentives. It's all about the power that your story has, but then the collective weight, it's like a collective action problem, right? 32 million Americans in this country have food allergies. Without some sort of body like FAIR, for example, to bring them all, all together, it's, co it's collective action issue. Like we can't all somehow create a, a big union and storm the Capitol and say, we want, air, we want EpiPens on every airplane or we need stricter uh, requirements for restaurants, but it's, but it's through these connections that we make that we can bring that case to the Capitol, bring that to our state legislator, bring it to our administrators. I hope that was a little helpful. But. 
Very helpful. Thank you. Um, our next few questions, we got a, a few come in about college just in general and preparation for college and, you know, the, the application process and how that goes. And, you know, when you first start approaching colleges regarding your allergies, you know, do you include, you know, that part in your narrative? And I know you guys are all in different points, you know, whether an undergraduate, graduate or Lizzie, I know you're, you're probably looking at schools now. Um, and it's such a big time for self-advocacy. So is there anything you could, you know, speak to, to, to both teens and parents when it comes to that, that stage in life of going away to college? Absolutely. So for me, um, I started one school and then I transferred. So when I went to my first school, I got accepted there. And then I reached out um, about my food allergies because I didn't want to sort of have my um, college list, um, you know, hindered by my food allergies. And again, because I am the age that I am, it was a battle that my parents and I knew that we were going to have to take on. There wasn't really, um, you know, food allergy awareness at any of these universities when I was first starting. Um, so that was when I was first um, starting. Then when I transferred, I decided that I did want to write about my uh, food allergies. And so there was um, an essay where you had to say something unique about yourself. And my opening uh, sentence was some, that sometimes I eat cake for breakfast. And then I went on to explain how that was because of my food allergies. And you know, if there's a day that there is nothing available and I'm on vacation and there is you know, something that's a dessert that I can have, sometimes I'll take a bite of that for breakfast and sort of went on in that way. Um, I could talk all day about co my college experience and how uh, my food allergies played into that. So people can feel free again to reach out to me um, if they want to have further discussions about that. Um, but yes, of course, you know, when you go to college, unfortunately, your food allergies don't go away. And um, that's, you know, where I had to deal with having an anaphylactic reaction without my parents around um, and sort of start to figure some of these harder things out on my own. Um, and also speak up for myself because nobody else was there to do it for me. So just kind of having those experiences and being truly independent, that, that was what the, the college experience was for me. <laughs> I'm gonna jump in really quick before we go to the next question. Cause if there's more then I, I can maybe hold off. But, oh man, guys, I had never had an allergic reaction before college. Uh, I had one anaphylactic reaction before college, but being on your own, is totally different than your parents purchasing all your food for you. Um, there's just, it's kind of by definition that there will be more risks now that you're on your own. And if, for example, in my situation, we have dining halls, we don't have the option to cook our own food um, at Harvard. This was the same situation at Yale and many of Har in Princeton, many of the other schools that I was looking at, um, I was ma mainly uh, shooting for IVs at, during when I was in high school and and um, I knew that I was gonna have to contact the accessibility office and talk to them about what accommodations could they make for me. And they can make accommodations. So the one thing that schools that have dining halls, one of the most common things that these schools will do is you can place an order beforehand. And if there's mess halls for like everybody else and they'll just go get their rent, their normal meal, you can actually, reserved to have your food be made separately from everyone else. God bless, I have never had a reaction based on the Harvard Dining Hall food. It has actually been when I've been out to eat, it's been on an airplane, it's been a cliff bar that I picked up at a student event that I didn't know, and that was my only time that I've had to go in an ambulance was actually my freshman fall. And so I'm not saying this to scare you, I'm saying this to be prepared. You know, I had my EpiPens, I knew what to do. Um, and for parents out there, please don't be afraid. That's not the point of me saying all this, uh, but it's all about preparation and uh, things can, accidents can happen. And so you just need to be prepared for that. Awesome, thank you. And I will give a little shout out to Sarah because she participated in a webinar called Ask the College Students in August and it's up on FAIR's website. Um, it's just foodallergy.org slash webinars. And, and she and a couple other panelists provided some really great information. So please go check that out. Um, Sarah, this is actually a question for you. Um, 
uh, one of our attendees wanted to know if you reach out to brands and ask to partner with them, or do they typically reach out to you? Can you talk a little bit about what that process is? My computer froze for a second. So. Oh no, are you there? Okay, well, we can come back to her when she I have a is. Quick Pardon me? I have a quick answer. Oh, well there, thank you. Yeah. And I'm actually, so Sarah is a big name. Y'all know Sarah, she's girl behind the hive. She is a big deal. Um, just, so if you don't have a big name, that's all I, what I wanna say is that's okay. Because guess what? I have cold emailed, cold DM'd people on Instagram and said, hey, I would love to partner with you. Could I try some of your products and share a review? Um, and talk about it on my Instagram. And guess what? They responded to me and shipped me free stuff. So, and this has happened many, many times. Sometimes they say no, uh, but some, a lot of the times I would say like seven times out of 10, they say yes. So go for it. But let's hear what Sarah says if she gets back online. Sarah, are you here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yep, we can hear okay. you. Perfect. Sarah, sorry to cut you off, but you're cutting out. So we will we will hold tight for her response and feel free to interrupt me if you get back online. And then I know I've kept you ladies after time, but I'd love to, to just ask one last question before I pass it to you to end it. And this is just kind of uh, about school again, but more in like the high school environment. And we, we have a school nurse joining us and she just wanted to remind everybody that they are some of your greatest allies in school. And she was wondering, um, you know, what recommendations for school nurses or even, you know, for a teen in the high school environment who's interested in spreading awareness. I know, Lizzie, you talked about the Be a Pal program, but is there kind of, you know, any advice that you give to teens and then kind of anything that you'd like school nurses to know so that maybe they can help support those efforts? That's such a great question. Um, starting off with the nurse, I definitely have a good relationship with my nurse. She is so understanding and she knows all about my allergies. Um, so I definitely would advise that you communicate with your nurse ahead of time and let them know what you're allergic to. Um, I've been to her several times when I'm having a reaction and just have sat in her office. So having that support has been so helpful. And then for spreading awareness in school, I have had friends who have started clubs, which I'm looking into right now. I think that's such an awesome idea. Um, but I've also told my teachers about my advocacy efforts. Um, I've told them about how I have presented at fair conferences in the past, and I've spread awareness um, through the fair fly-in for Congress. And it's just about getting my, the word out there definitely through friends. I think starting a club would be like one of the best ways that you can spread awareness. I love that idea. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we may have lost Sarah, unfortunately, but um, if she has time to come and join us again, that'd be great. If not, no problem. And I'd like Lizzie and Alexa, if I can ask, um, is there one piece of advice that you'd like to leave, you know, the teens that are joining us today with, if there was one thing you kind of want them to take away from all of this great information. And Lizzie, we can start with you. So I would tell teens to not be afraid to put yourself out there and go advocate. I definitely was afraid, like I said, when I started, but as I did it more, I just fell in love with it. And it opened so many opportunities for me. So don't be afraid and just, Go out there, share your story, um, share it with Congress members, share it with your friends, share it with your community. It's such a wonderful thing to do and it will actually help so many people. Thank you, Alexa. Yes, so there is a lot I want to say. Um, oh man. Can you hear me? Yeah. You're there. What happened? You're That's still there. Okay. But let me get up a quote really quick. This is actually on my website that I created yesterday um, because based on Sarah's recommendation. So give me just a second. So this is a quote by Lynn Manuel Miranda and it really has inspired me uh, quite a bit and I, I resonate it quite deeply. So the quote is, you cannot let all the world's tragedies into your heart, you'll drown. But the ones you do, 
let in should count. Let them manifest action. And so I just want to leave you guys just with the brief message that be bold. Um, you have one life to live and you have one life to, to give in the service of others. And uh, sharing your story will help others. And you have a powerful voice and please use it because um, you have a lot of power and people want to hear from you. So go out and I'm really excited to see all the wonderful food allergy advocacy you all will be doing. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. And thank you to Sarah as well for joining us. Your stories are so inspiring. You have so much experience and you really are, are changing the world. So thank you, ladies. Um, and thank you all of our attendees for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thank you.